in the 80s, the, the racing was, it was almost, we were having, we were doing sponsors for three years and we, we were turning people away left and right. It was, the money was coming in, the support was coming in, everybody, General Motors from all these companies were wanting to help us uh, be better and better and better and it was pretty much anything you needed you could get. And back in the day with Dale Earnhardt, you would go, we'd go to the racetrack like we would go to Charlotte on Wednesday and we would qualify four laps, then practice on Thursday, then practice on Friday, then practice on Saturday. But through this whole thing, we had qualifying engines, we had practice engines, we had race engines, and it was a small group of guys. Basically, there were 10 guys that worked here at the shop that went to the racetrack, and we had people that continued at the shop, fabricators and stuff. But in those 10 guys were Richard, the driver, the crew chief, the truck driver, the shop guy, and we did everything, including pitting the car. So, when you change the engine three times in a weekend, yeah. it would not be uncommon at all, changing the engines out three times back then. At that time, when we moved into this building, and I can remember, we'd been in this building about a year and a half, and look who showed up. There's another guy we're talking about. I've been in, this, been in this building about a year and a half, and Richard came in and said, hey, we're going to put upgrade our phone system and they're gonna work in your room for about three or four days, which is the very back room. So I had to move all my stuff out, and I remember the guy came in and he said, y'all are gonna have 50 phone lines. You'll <laughs> never have to need that many because right now you only have 12. And it wasn't, it wasn't but about eight months, so we had to come in and do it another panel. I mean, we went, at, at the time, when we moved into this building, it was progressing so, so, so much. Wow. That it, 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 we couldn't hardly keep up with it. I told him shocked about how we would know what the sponsor was going to be for three years and how we would go to Charlotte and, and have a qualifying engine and a practice engine and a okay. race engine. Chocolate was, he was everything. You all know Chocolate? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So Chocolate was the first guy, but one of the things I really liked is, is that, so, so when I talked to you guys about changing gears, Chocolate's the guy that changed the gears. He had, a, he would fix these little neat toolboxes with everything, the little thing to hold the drive shaft out of place, and every little wrench, and this and that. No gloves, no nothing. I mean, he would come to work <laughs> with his gray suit on and after we've been there 30 minutes he looked like he got through changing the oil on the tractor trailer <laughs> but and we also had Earnhardt helped us a lot we have a lot of stories that Chaka can tell like the time that Kurt Shelmerdeen drew a hole drew a hole through Earnhardt's finger whenever Earnhardt was helping us on the car <laughs> I mean, Earnhardt was dangerous by the way <laughs> uh, good morning everybody good morning to welcome uh, Sorry, I'm a little bit late, I but I wanted to. I didn't use your line. I said, welcome, welcome. Well, no, we're still, we're still, we're still all, we still have good stuff. I, I'm going to spend a few minutes with you guys this morning. And, uh, guys, i, I got to be honest with you. Just listening to Danny and and the reason Danny's telling you this thing, we're proud. We're proud of what we've been able to accomplish here. And, and I thought about this a little bit. And, and Mike Dillon has not thought about this. <laughs> but in the bottom of this building here, when you get there early later today, there's going to be a car down there. Forty years ago, we won our first race here at Richard Children's Race. Forty years ago, uh, with Piedmont Airlines, with, oh, with yeah. Ricky Rudd at Riverside, California. I came along right after that, right, right after that. I was not here for the first one, but I've been here for the rest of them. And uh, we're, we're just proud of that. Danny was talking about me working on the car. We all did everything. Danny was the motor guy, but didn't have a problem carrying out the trash. You know, I, I was the gear guy and didn't have a problem mopping the floor. And everybody that worked here did the same thing. Everybody, we did it all. You had a Volkswagen van. Oh, I had a Volkswagen van that I stayed in. That I stayed in. 
Yeah. I said, who's in the van? Okay. In the van. It was on yeah. another thing. He stayed in the yeah. van at the race shop. Oh, yeah. Stayed in Volkswagen uh, bus. But that was a different time and a different story. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into all of that. One of the things that one of the things that we kind of had a hard time with is, is Richard came in and, and said, all right, Earnhardt will want us to race after Earnhardt got killed and, and we're going to make some changes and this and that. So we got ready to go to Atlanta and Earnhardt had the car that he loved at Atlanta and, and he was like, we're going to take Earnhardt's car. Well, we didn't really want to take Earnhardt's car because we wanted to save it. But Richard was right because we knew we knew it was a really good car for Atlanta. We knew about the era. We knew the whole deal, and that's the first car Kevin won with. And that was that was really enlightening to us. When we went to Rockingham after Earnhardt got killed, we were we we were pretty much zombies. I mean, we we don't even hardly remember half of it. But going to Atlanta that helped us heal. And Richard was right. If we wouldn't have took Earnhardt's car, I don't believe he would have ever won that race because we knew. What he needed to go fast, and, and Kevin did an amazing job for us. Yeah, the truck series, there is a, a lease engine program. Our deal is still pretty much the same, except all they've done is challenged us to. We have to run it twice. Yes. In cup and so three times in Xfinity. You can run, you can run it as many times as you, you want. You have to have in Xfinity. You have to have 14 sealed engines. And what NASCAR does is, is when you present it, when you present a new engine, they put a seal on it. And you have to run 14 times a motor, 14 times basically, not half the season, but almost half the season. Then once you win, they cut those seals off and they put a red seal on them. And then even if you win with that motor, you can race it again. But I, it's it's like eight weeks before you go to the last race, all the engines have to be torn down and, and everything approved. You really, it's really not official until the motor's been checked. But the, the valve truck, springs are still changed every race, right? Yeah, so, so you go run the engine, and when it comes back, the engine shop cleans the engine first. They pull it apart. They change all the valve springs. They they measure the camshaft. They change the clutch, uh, belts, anything that that yeah. needs to be. You know, they go through. Then they run it back on the dyno to make sure that it's that it's where it should be. One the race there at Daytona. Uh, this thing stayed there for a year. We brought it back. We cleaned it up. Uh, Danny, these guys put the engine back together, so all the engines in here. Of course, we drained the fluids out of it, took the battery out of it, but it's all original other than that. Quick story here I want to tell you. Does anybody remember the Lucky Penny, the, the little girl, Wessa, uh, that, that was part of the Sunshine Foundation, one of those groups, and she gave Dale a Lucky Penny. We glued it on the dash of this car. It's still on the dash of this car, okay? I'm, I'm going to add a little bit to that story because it was a great story. They made posters about it and all this. Uh, I was fortunate that, that there's uh, there's my wife up there. there. There's my daughter that now has children of her own with her hat on backwards. Uh, there's Austin and Ty, uh, of course. So we were all there that day uh, and in Victory Lane. My wife, was uh, she did local news here on Fox 8 News, right? So Daytona's over, this is all good. We open the museum, everything's good and grand. I'm at the museum, Richard tells me to get people in here. I gotta figure out a way to let people know about it, to get people in. And I get a phone call, the museum had been open about a year, and I get a phone call, and it said Wessa and her mother wanted to come visit the museum. Hey, I'm not stupid, right? I call my wife and I go, I got a great human interest story for you. This is free advertisement, man. I'm gonna get the newspaper, I mean the, 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 the Fox News to come over and do this story. So they come over, Wessa, her mother's here, my wife's here, the camera guys are here shooting, and they're doing this great story, right? And, and look, we Danny's told you about Earnhardt, Mike, we were all close. We were a close group of people. We flew on that airplane together, we rode together, we stayed together, we did a lot of stuff together. But I want to tell you a little bit more about that story. My wife asked all the right questions about how cool it was, how great it was, how grand it was to be a part of that. And she does her story. And she's she's done. She's over. And my wife stepped, she said, one, one, one more question. She said, did you ever meet Dale again after the Daytona race? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact, we did. He invited us to Bristol later that year. 
that's when he gave us the handicap band that we're still driving today. Wow. Wow. That's what, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm like, I've never heard it. Nobody had ever mentioned it. But that one right there is one of those stories. 28, 8, 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was actually the time that you were on pit road, not the pit stop. But a pit stop then, probably around 18 seconds, right? And that was a good pit stop. But here's the deal. We never practiced. We never worked at it. We didn't do, we didn't have time. Now, we, wait a minute. We were, we were way ahead of the game, though. Because you've been we listening were the, to Richard. No, we were, the first, <laughs> we were the first team to have a gym. We had a this gym is upstairs. way before that. We had a gym upstairs. <laughs> this is and way then, before that. We had a pit wall. We practiced out back. Yep. We were the first ones to start that. Now you know, hey, we did it the best way we could. We went yep. and got some plywood and built us a, a pit wall. This is before that. <laughs> yeah. This I, is. I, I Danny what, mentioned while I go working twelve hours. I tell her, but they go we talk about working, and I say we only worked half day. But you also drove. Hours. Hey, you also drove to most of the racetracks. Oh yeah. I can remember forward. when I can remember when David Smith said, "I got this new jack, and it only weighs 27 pounds." Mm -hmm. Because when that record was made with a steel jack, and it was a regular jack where you, where it would take like eight pumps to mm -hmm. pump it up. Oh, yeah. 15, 50, 50 some pounds. Yeah. Jack. Oh yeah. That door right over there. We found that in, in the body shop. That that was a sample. They they painted that to. Let all the sponsors and everybody see it. But here's the cool thing about this car. True story, we're gonna be in here in just a few minutes. None of us, Danny, myself, uh, Kirk, whoever else was on this program, none of us got to see that car. We worked on that car, got it ready for the all-star race in that room, it was in primer. And they said, okay, y'all are done get out, go home, and we left this building. The first time I saw that car was we were at Charlotte Motor Speedway and we opened the doors of the truck. The first time I ever saw that silver car. We, no, that, that's, what, that's when you could keep a secret. You can't anymore. You know, there, there, there's no such thing. Well, that was still your cell phone had a dial on it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all these cars in, in this room are special events cars, silver car, Olympic car, Wheaties car, Bass Pro, Wrangler, Peter Max, and then you've got our cars that we ran in Japan and a Daytona, the Taz car. So these were all special events cars and, and we really had a good time. I wanna, wanna say one thing that, that a lot of people, some of these cars, we may have raced them as a special event car. We may have turned around and they were black cars again and we used them till we were, they were used up and then we put them back like they are here. So, so guys, I'm I'm going to tell you one more here real quick. <laughs> this is a surface plate. Okay? Surface plate is a level surface. That, that, that's all it is. I, I'm going to just use that. That's all it is. We won four championships and God knows probably at least 50 or more races. And we hired Andy Petrie. And by the way, Andy still works here today and he is a dear friend and I love him to death. But Andy was always one of those forward-thinking guys, right? So Andy comes in here, like his first day, and he says, where's the surface plate? Where's the surface plate at? Well, what? <laughs> where's your surface plate? <laughs> What's the surface plate? Where do you set the cars up at? Oh, right here, right here in the middle of the floor. Concrete. No, you gotta have a level surface. <laughs> with feed scales, the floor feed scales too. Feed, with feed, feed scales, scales too. We use feed scales. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, old feed scales like you go to the feed store and buy your grain, right? Yeah. Grain scales. <laughs> and, and, he's, and, and he's going, that floor is not level. Well, yes, look at the floor. It's as level as it can be. So they go get the transit and the whole the, the electronic devices and they measure this thing. And it's only about that far off, right? It's only about that far unlevel. So they come in, they saw this thing out and they bring this big piece of steel in. No, they did. They did. Well, Me and yeah. you did. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my job back in the day. Outside, oh, yeah. anything, anything that, that nobody else wanted to do, Chocolate would get it and he would give it to me. And teach me how to do it. I'm going to show you how to do this. I'll be right back. Cut this right here. I'll be right oh, back. I'm coming right back. Yeah. <laughs> they put this thing in. They put this thing and they got it sitting here. They're not quite finished yet. And, and Richard comes in and sees it. And he went, man, that damn thing is bent. I'm like, no, 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 Richard. This is straight, the floor's white. <laughs> so if, if, and the reason I say that, if you guys kind of look at this thing and the light's shining on it right, 
you can see where we, we brought the floor up to, to, to match it. But anyway, this is a surface plate. This is what it is. When you get to the other building, you're going to see a room full of them. You see a room By the way, if anybody it. feels like climbing in this car, get your picture made. Anybody? We, we got this here for you to get in. Get your picture made. We well, can do it after we or get back. Or you can just too. open the door. <laughs> Chevrolet had an antique engine. And, and there's no better way to put it. You know, my, my dear friend Larry McReynolds talks about how many races he won and how good they were. They probably had 80 more horsepower than this, right? They, they had a modern engine. We raced in an engine that came out in a 1955 Chevrolet. This is in the 90s, man. And, and, and we had done all you could possibly do with that engine. Couldn't make, we would go to the racetrack, go practice a few laps and pull in the garage area, water's running out the tailpipes. That, that was common, right? Chevrolet decides to build some new cylinder heads. And this is the first set that they built. They're called SB2. Uh, small block, second generation. If you notice, these valve covers, they didn't even have valve covers. We had to make our own valve covers. And we build this engine. We build our first SB2 engine and we run it on the dyno and we find out right away, we're better than we had been. But how are we compared to those other guys? By the way, the computer stuff, it's not there yet. We don't have all that technology. So we gotta compare apples to apples. I'm gonna show you guys something. There's only one of them in the world. The engine right beside of it, another small block Chevrolet engine. Same bore, same stroke, same cam, same lifter, same everything except for one thing. That is a small block Chevrolet engine with a set of Ford cylinder heads on it. <laughs> now, before anybody thinks that we raced this engine, we, that, that engine has never been in a race car. Never put it in a race car, put it on the dyno to compare apples to apples. And we found out right away that we were pretty close to where those guys were. So those are the kind of things you had to do. Uh, the story has it, those guys down in the engine shop worked a couple of months to do that. Remember, you got to re-drill, re-bore, weld up those holes. That, that's Ford cylinder heads with a Chevrolet intake on top of it. So you can see where they cut it and moved it. But, but that right there was the way that we had to figure out what we had compared to what they had. How tough it was on all of us to come back in here. Uh, after we lost Dale, and, and I can't tell you what all happened, I don't remember. I remember very little about that week. All, all I know is that we came back, and the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, we had to come in here, we had to take threes off of everything. We had people that, we had, we had some of our vendors that came over and said, let us help you. We, we, we'll help you. And we would do that for a while, and we'd cry for a while. I, I mean, I, I just... We came to work the next morning at seven o'clock with no direction of what we were going to do. We, we had no idea. The reason I tell you this story is we, we were doing really, really good. And back then there was no such thing as the transporter. You'd go out and buy a truck and you'd build your own truck. But because we were the champion and because Dale Earnhardt was the guy, this company comes to us, Featherlight comes to us and says, we want to build you guys a, a, a transporter. So they build us a transporter. We use it all year. At the end of the year, they take it back, they sell it, they give us another one. And we had gone through that process for several years. We lose Dale. We have to come in here and we have to take this transporter and, and take everything off of it. I think we went to the racetrack that week, maybe with a blank truck that, that we got it painted white. It became a 29 truck, you know, later. As soon as we could do that, we raced it the rest of the year. At the end of the year, Featherlight took it back, we got another. When we built this museum, Richard said, call Featherlight, find out who bought that transporter, buy it back, and put it back the way that it was. So that's what we've done. We've got this thing open for you guys to walk through. And, and, and enjoy it. This is the way that this was. But go through the transporter, enjoy yourself. If anybody asks the question of why all these signatures are on the wall, every once in a while some marketing genius comes up with an idea that just is <laughs> don't work. And this is exactly what that is. We, we decided one time that we were going to put these walls up 
we were going to charge two dollars extra to get in the museum and we're going to give everybody a souvenir pin and they could sign the wall we spent a whole lot more on this wall <laughs> than, 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 than we got in return on those pins because if you can see we started with this up here they signed all the loads in a few months then we did this down here and then we decided to discontinue that problem. Never let people think it's okay to come in a museum and sign something because they've not stopped. We, we've asked them to stop. Please don't sign the wall. So that's what that is. If you guys make a pass through this stuff. Oh, darn. Make a pass through this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. By, by the way, one, one quick note here. Um, we, we didn't have our, our, our hauler, I mean our... Um, our truck, our tractor, was almost brand new, and we could not do that. So we went and bought a, a, an old Peterbilt truck that, that looked pretty good. We painted it, we cleaned it, and we hooked it to it. That's what this video is. We had that we had that truck hooked to it for about ten years until we mileaged out the original tractor. We we pulled this out. We hooked the original tractor to it. That's what's sitting up there right now. So that's that's what this is about. Wow. Yeah, that trailer you had your trailer. This is an old style race car. This is what we used to race, right? And if you'll notice, this car is all one piece. Everything is welded together. We, we could fix these back in the day by cutting the back or the front off and putting them. But usually when you wreck these cars, they were done. When you see that new car over there, the, the reason I'm pointing this out, the new car is in three pieces. It's got a center section, it's got a front and a rear. They bolt together. They bolt together. So uh, just check that out when you get over there. This room was the fan shop. This is where we put all these things together back in the day. If anybody ever wanted to see this, this is the gas tank, better known as a fuel cell. Uh, this one's got a cutaway in it. This foam is to keep that gas from sloshing around in there. But down in the bottom of this thing is a trap door. That's where the fuel picks up at. So when you see those guys sloshing around, they're trying to get this thing here full of fuel when, when they're getting low. So this is old school. We don't run it quite like this, but it's the same principle. By the way, they're, they're, they're made out of rubber like that so that they can crush. And you can crash one of these cars. Back in the day when that gas tank gun, they crushed these things, gas tank split. And this Get ready to go into our wildlife and conservation area. So just so you know, every time we sell a ticket to the museum, we support four conservation groups, Ducks Unlimited, National Wild Turkey Federation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and the North Carolina Wildlife Habitat Foundation. When you get in here, you're going to see a lot of hunting trophies, a lot of dead animals that are mounted. <laughs> and that offends some people, right? They go in there and go, how do you do this? I'm going to tell you how you do it and why you do it. And I've got one of the coolest stories that you're ever going to hear. I'm a North Carolina guy. I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I love the wildlife. Do you realize for the first time in over 200 years, you can go to the North Carolina mountains and elk or walk in the streets, free and wild, right? Without this, and people like this, that don't happen. That don't happen. So the, the, the people, Richard Childress is a great example. You know, uh, others are out there, plenty of others out there, that have been fortunate enough to make a little bit of money to be able to support wildlife and conservation. And all of the land that's out there now that's been bought up, that, that will always be free, that, that nobody's going to build on it. You know, you hear all those stories. But because of these people and, and some of the things we do here, that has made all these other things happen. So I've only had one or two that just like, oh God, I can't believe. I'm like, hold on a minute. There's something else on that too. For every hunting and fishing license that's purchased in North Carolina or any other state, the majority of the money actually goes to your wildlife uh, resources and parks. Where a lot of people just want to go trail walking or that type of stuff, there's no other way they fund it than that. So you ought to, you ought to look that up and just look at the amount of money that goes into your your national parks and stuff due to hunting and fishing licenses. 
give you a little bit more information, but I can tell you. Hey, Mike. Mike. Mike, they're calling for you. So, this polar bear right here, yeah. Richard, he was 33 miles out on the ocean floor in the ice. Mm -hmm. And he stayed three days in the tent. Yeah. And I said, How did you do that? He said, Well, I ate beanie weenies, this and that. And it, it, he said, I was so bored. He said, I. I read over and over and over the back of my toothpaste. I learned where toothpaste was made. And he said, the crazy thing is, is these polar bears are really cute, but he said, when you hunt them, they'll come back around the back side and they'll hunt you back. <laughs> that these things are bad, bad, bad. That yep. they, they will eat you. But this was this is like a, a record polar bear. He's one of the biggest ones that have been taken out of Alaska. But the big, uh, the crazy thing when he told us that story, I mean, he's he camped on the ocean, frozen, 33 miles out. And uh, they say every morning you wake up and you hope that hope that your huskies are still there because uh, they would eat those. Yeah. And what what happens is the polar bears would go to wherever the seals were, so so you never knew where they were going to be. And, with the wind blowing and all the ice, he said they're really hard to see. But this is a, this is like a a record polar bear. He is. It's so cold that you know if any of you are familiar with guns or cleaning guns, you don't put any oils or anything on your gun when you clean it. You put put it back bare metal uh, because the gun will, would freeze stuck, and then your gun wouldn't work. I mean, he's, so you you actually cleaned it and did not put any like we normally would all put gun oil back on it, you did not do that because it would freeze it. And then there's other ways that guys have thought of unthawing their gun, which would actually freeze instantly too. So, wow. And you're, you're in trouble then. And so Earnhardt, we lose Earnhardt, and we decided, you know, the good ranch, uh, you know, broke all the contracts and this and that. And Richard's like, I want to do something totally different. So that's when they came up with the white, and NASCAR has a list of numbers. And so they looked at the numbers, and they're trying to figure out, you know, we didn't want, we didn't want to do anything that was going to throw off from Earnhardt or whatever. So. They decided on the 29. A lot of people don't know this, but they never they never called it. But a lot of people say it's 2.9, almost three, but not. <laughs> but the 29 is the, the closest number that was available to the three. And that's why we got. Um, and but this is the, this was Earnhardt's car that he won four Atlanta races in. And back in the day, you would you win Atlanta race and he you. Speedboat. And I think Richard still had Earnhardt had two, and I think Richard still had two, doesn't he? You want to talk about your car? Four of them. Pardon? You want to talk about your car? Well, uh, not really. He <laughs> said, not really. <laughs> Uh, it ain't got none. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he just said how many wins does that thing have? Actually, that particular car with that color and paint scheme won um, Colorado Pikes Peak with Jeff Purvis in the car the year that I got out. And he dang almost lapped the field in it. I never actually ran the car with that darker red. It was more of this bright red with that. But uh, that's that's the facts on that car. How come it didn't have any wins on it? Because I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went in and had no more ammunition. So, 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 straight to the point. That's it. That's right. Yeah. I won a bunch of races in Lake Mall. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not in that thing. I had a couple. I had a couple in the '72 car, Hickory and uh, 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 St. Louis. That, that not nothing like uh, 
for that reason. That is sharp. No, I'm going to show you what it is. Up here. But, but, but this is a cool car. This is a cool car. It's, so we got a. We just gave it to uh, NASCAR Hall of Fame. Uh, we got an 86 Monte Carlo, which is my favorite car. Uh, I think it's 86, isn't it, Danny? 86 had them. Yeah. The, the, sure. the, 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 the same car with that back glass. But that car was the first. First race on radial tires, the last race for that body style at North Wilkesboro, we won it. And that car, Richard took it off the track with the confetti, everything damaged, everything that we put in this museum. And it's still, the engine and all, everything. And I was like, why in the new world are we taking a perfectly good race car and going to do this? Well, this is why. I, Here, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> She was trying to make it where I wasn't going to get it. <laughs> Piedmont Airlines at the time, they had, once the sale, they had 3,000 employees. And uh, that, was a, that was a big, they were growing in leaps and bounds, and American Airlines ended up buying them out. They kept Piedmont Airlines for a short term, and then they, they ended up changing all the Piedmont Airlines. What was it called? U.S. Air? Yeah, U.S. Air Ball. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. To train young engineers, to train young drivers, trained crew chiefs and it's actually a stepping stone to the cup series richard uh, he cut a deal with tyler reddick to come and run and tyler the reason tyler came is because he wanted to get to the cup series he wasn't junior motorsports and junior and richard are they're really tight they uh they do a lot of business deals together well at junior motorsports there was no no place for Reddit to go run in the Cup Series. So so we got Tyler, and uh, Tyler was one of those drivers that knew what he wanted, and he helped us make our cars better. This car right here has one race on it. As we, as we ran Tyler, we kept making the cars better for his liking style, and we built a brand new car to go to uh, the Brickyard. And him and Christopher Bell, Traded the lead back and forth, back and forth on the last lap. Christopher Bell got underneath him. Both of them wrecked and total lost the car that's the sister to this car. That car had didn't even complete the whole race. It was a brand new car. So Reddick, at the time, he's dizzy. He uh, wasn't sleeping at night. He had a concussion from that wreck. So uh, there's a guy named Charlie Branch that actually is the one that did Earnhardt's neck surgery and he was a neurosurgeon. His son is uh, a neurosurgeon in Charlotte and Dr. Branch and Byron and Dr. Byron Branch, we carried Tyler to a midnight scan at the hospital uh, in Charlotte because if NASCAR finds out that this is before the concussion protocol they won't let you race and we're running for the championship and uh, he they actually cleared him and he had he had a slight bruise of the brain and it took it took about two or three weeks but we ended up replacing that car with this car that actually won the championship so this car here in 2019, we built two new cars, is all we built. The one that wrecked it, Indy, and this car right here has one race on it, and this is Homestead. And Richard took this car just like it is, still has the engine in it, still has the champagne on it, and she sits right here today just like she just like she won the race with. This whole road down through here about a clean championship car.
Now there's, where's that one that said racing was racing? Yeah, here you go. Right, here you go, steel bumpers. Oh my. <laughs> you look in there and look at what the man had to hang on to on that bumper. <laughs> Steering wheel taped up. Taped up. Yeah. Did, have, did they have power steering or did they run a, a manual box? They run a manual box early on and then Jeff O'Dine came in and brought power steering and it was about... They ran a rear steer though. Yeah, that yes. steered easier. Yes. Yeah. In about 81, Jeff O'Dine brought power steering from the modified That's series. That's a cool car. I would like to have a car like that to drive on the street today. That's, that's a cool <laughs> car right there. Danny Lawrence probably has two or three of those put up in his car collection somewhere. Remember what years it was, maybe not for this particular car, but this is how crazy the rules had gotten for NASCAR. What well, Chocolate was saying earlier about their new car. If you let, them, let us out of the box, we will take advantage, and you can right here is a perfect example. <laughs> just look at how twisted this car is from the back side. You just the roof, the quarter panel. There's nothing about it, and it actually has a set of templates that fit. But if you don't put them on at the same time, if you put them on, if you know the order they're gonna put them on, then you can manipulate it. It'll fit, but it's so you'll see how twisted this thing is, and it's it's actually uh, that's you know. About where, where, and it really got crazy at the end when they knew we were going to a new car, the CO2. You get to experience that. They were, they were, Ronnie and Kix and, and Dale and Rich were really good friends, and there was a guy named Hank Jones that, that, <coughs> Did the Silvernair, he was Earnhardt's Silvernair president of the Silvernairs, and then they had a company called Sports Image. And uh, Hank, he was a talker, and he talked Kicks and Ronnie and put him in a video. And the video of Big Cat Daddy is <laughs> that's actually Hank Jones. Yeah. Well, then Earnhardt sees it and says, I want to be in a video. <laughs> <laughs> so then that, that was the video that he was in. Uh, Earnhardt was in the video after Hank, and Hank laughed and laughed and laughed about that. But they, Ronnie and Kix and, and Dale and Richard, they were really, really tight. And we, we, surfed, we, we worked on this car and for them a little bit, and they, they always they give Richard stuff. Richard has stuff from the Grand Ole Opry. He's got like one of the first microphones from the Grand Ole Opry and this and that. And Richard saved, he, he saved stuff. He had, there's no telling how much stuff that he has. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't think we're gonna be able to record once we get in the back. If we can, we will. Hope you guys and girls are enjoying this video. A lot of great stories. As always, please make sure you subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so. Ring that bell and leave happy comments. Last time we were in here doing the Dale Earnhardt video, there were two other cars in here. Not now. The sponsors, we had so many sponsors at the time, he said, we need to build a show place for the sponsors. Somewhere where they can go and they can actually see the cars. And we've built this fan wall that, that it, it's open five days a week where you can come up and go through and you can see the trucks and you can see the shop and you can see the guys working on the car and then you can go out to the parking lot. Uh, but the, the crazy thing is, is that uh, Richard's building this thing and we, we start building this building and everything was progressing so much that before we, before we even got the plans finished, he already added on to it because <laughs> we, we built a, Richard wanted everything in one place. But then after, before, before it, the plans got finalized, he's like, there's no way I can put the engine shop in here. Um, so we actually have two engine shops. We have a, what they call the research and development engine shop and then we have the production shop. 
So as you go through the complex, you'll see ECR, R, and D. That w that's where everything's developed, and once it gets developed, and once it's blessed, then it goes to production. The production guys, they don't do any research and development. They just build the recipe. The, the engine stuff's so sophisticated now, if, if an engine's one or two horsepower off, they figure out why. They know exactly what power it's gonna make. All of our engines are within less than a percent of each other, right? Yes. So even when we were making 800 plus horsepower, we were less than a percent apart on the engine. Is it easier for you guys to build low horsepower? Or? Uh, no. So, so I mean, NASCAR, okay. when NASCAR told us that we had to run the engines multiple times, they came in and they put, it's a restrictor plate, but they call it a tapered spacer. And they basically cut our horsepower down from 900 to 670 or 700, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of dyno you have. Um, and after that, continue to work and work and work. Now they've got what they call a 750 package. It was the same thing whenever they first came out. You made about 660 horsepower. As they developed it, they they picked back up basically almost 90 horsepower. Because, you know, from the GM support, I want to start Dale Earnhardt Incorporated so that I can help us win the championship because we would get double wind tunnel time, we would get double parts, we'd get double support, double engineering. So Richard and Dale had a plan. DEI was never against us. The whole plan was to for us to work together. Also here, Richard says, everything, just like that silver car, everything got out of, out of here. You know, whenever we were gonna do something secret, we we're gonna announce a sponsor. If somebody came in and said, say Ferris Motors was gonna be our, our Ferris Lawnmower is going to be our new sponsor. People would find out about it, and then all these teams would go in and try to lowball them. So here on this facility, we can we have a photo studio to where, say, if you're going to UPS is going to sponsor us, we can come in, we can design the car here. We have design staff. We can sell the deal, then we can do the photo studio. We can build the postcards. We can do the commercial here. We can do the whole thing. Everything's on the complex. We don't have to go outside where anybody else finds out about it. Then when we announce it, it's all locked up. So we figured out a long time ago, anything that you can do yourself, you can do better. We make our own valve springs now, which is a major, major, major deal. How, and just, just getting the valve spring development, Mike had a lot to do with that building. All. How, where are we at money-wise on the valve spring? On springs? On, on building the building, on all the equipment. A lot. It's probably twenty-five million dollars. No, I, well, I don't know. When I you when you put when you put 10, 11. we 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 developed them for three years. We we've got the state of the art machinery. The the wire comes I know from we Japan. Have property. Yeah, Not the wire comes from Japan. <laughs> Every race that Hendrick has won and RCR has won this year has been done with the children's technology springs and this There's is only two companies that make them. yeah and, and so one of us is psi is in michigan and us are the only two that make the racing valve springs and if something were to happen to psi then yeah. it would devastate Sport. all of racing um so richard has that vision and he still does today is the more the more the stuff that you can do yourself the better off you are Okay. You see, we have to go. All right. They're waiting for are in this building now. Uh, and uh, as you go into the main shop, you'll see the cup assembly, you'll see the setup plates, and then you'll, we'll go back through the expanded building. Can you walk straight back through the good stop Yeah. Can you please? Because I don't know where exactly you There's a back. Well, they were in an old building and they switched places, and I haven't been to their new spot yet.
So as we walked into the race shop just a few moments ago, Austin Dillon's car, that is going to be used in Martinsville. I don't know if you could see the secondary car, but that's more of a larger speedway car. Now that's the number eight jack man right there for Kyle Bush. He's watching these developmental pit crews train. He gave him a thumbs up, said not bad. So you can see where the front clip's bolted on, the rear clip's the same way. Everybody's chassis in the whole field's exactly like this. There is a very few little things that can be different, but most of them are driver safety or driver comfort. How the most, seat's except for Andrew, right? But you can't get anything manufactured at no speed, so none of We do the lug nut here for everybody. And then uh, uh, Ralph Gates does some of the suspension parts. Well, back end of a rowdy car. the clip but you'd also replace the driver right. a couple times it happened sure yeah, we don't want to do that no. here's a rear clip the practice clip the the fuelers use and they this thing set up where they they not also not only that the fuelers use it but they've tried different hose configurations to try to make sure that the they can get the fuel in any kind of advantage you can get but you can see where the rear clip would bolt onto the back of this It's amazing the things you guys come up with. And they pump up the pump it. 
That's crazy. I don't care And that's where we're normally up there behind the glass shooting down. Not today. Not, not, not just the body, not just the body, all the suspension, the wheelbase, the tread, uh, the wheelbase, uh, the camber, the caster, it, it measures everything. There's my team. Me too. Peek back here one more time. Chatters number eight. And there's the three chi number eight. Is that one gonna be in Martinsville? Only time will tell. Again, usually we're up top, filming down. Now we're right here. Hey, there's a gas can. Think I got a shot? Very cool, just came out of the inspection tent with uh, Austin Dillon's car and Austin Dillon's crew chief. We got to watch him do the inspection with all the lasers. Pretty flipping awesome. We could not record. Yeah. Our late model, we literally had some, it would actually make you run it upside down like a car. It would add a hundred and fifty pounds of As soon as they run that inspection, they're going to load it right up in there and roll it to Martinsville. So now we measure everything to the detail. We've always done it. So this next room is another metrology area, and you'll see a car in here that they're measuring it to make sure that we got a car that they that they said it was this measurement. Same way with control arm and everything else. So they measure it to make sure that our accuracy goes into our database, and then when they build the car, we have our measurement. There may be a consistent deal that it's you know one way or another versus what NASCAR says it is. As long as we know it's that number, that's. The simulator is generated by on track, you know, uh, instrumentation and then just all the history that we have. We work if you're a if you're a key partner team, yeah, we work we share a lot. Yeah. Do you know, the car. Oh, 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 the car. Oh
still have to carry the weight in the same spot. And the, the very the very first time we go out, he hits the wall coming off of two and messes right rear quarter panel up. Very first lap. We come in, like, okay, it's not that bad. We're going to finish practice. We, we went and we epoxied it up, waited till we was going to wait till after qualifying to put a decal on it. Second practice, it goes, hits the wall in the exact same place. We epoxied it up, did it in qualifying. We kept the same quarter panel on, on that car, epoxied it up three times, hit the wall first lap of the race, and we were able to race that thing the whole time. We get back to the shop, and he's doing his debrief, and he says, I'll tell you this, the simulator's really good, because that's exactly where I hit the wall in the simulator. <laughs> we're like, why do you keep doing it? <laughs> but, so these bodies are incredible. They will, they will bounce back, uh, not like the metal. Who was that? That Tyler read it. Well, thank you, Andy Randolph. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's always fun having visitors. Uh, definitely appreciate you all coming. How come you have a head off the Cummins back there? The machine works for other. Oh, uh, wow. You guys, you're he's got some cool track. So. <laughs> So we just got out of the engine shop, had a great time, learned a lot, got to see all of the Childress and Hendrick engines from Bristol. And I gotta tell you, Kyle Busch, his engine was like the dirtiest engine out here. But they unloaded all of the engines, NASCAR has tagged those engines numerous times because they can clean those engines up to reuse them, but they cannot dismantle them. They cannot make any replacements or they get in a whole lot of trouble. But that was pretty awesome. Was not able to get any photos or videos in the engine shop, but I got some audio. If I can get some good audio to share with you, I definitely will do that. Now we're heading back to the museum and then we're gonna wrap up this video. We have made our way back into the gift shop. How are you feeling? 15 minutes. Yeah. The clock is all right. Yeah. Got that right. So thoughts and prayers go out to Chocolate Myers. Sat down with him in his office just before he's getting ready to go on the air here in just a little bit. And uh, he was telling us about his cancer. And uh, he knows my videos and remembers the last couple of times I've come in here and we get to talking every time. He lives over in Ocean Isle Beach, North Carolina. But, uh, oh look, DJ Wayne Adventures. But thoughts and prayers go out to him as he's battling chemo and medicines that's making him sick. And just thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family for sure. Great guy, great historian here at Richard Childress Racing. Well, that about does it for this awesome tour. Going to head back to the man cave. Going to start editing all of this. Get this online for everybody. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Leave great comments. From Richard Childress Racing in Welcome, North Carolina, 
This is DJ Wayne. We'll see you at the next video. Martinsville, just a couple of days away. Can't wait. So I'm gonna roll some footage here as we make our way out. One last look here. They offer this tour to the public about two or three times a year. So if you're interested, you can go on to Richard Childress Racing website. I'll put the link below and you can get signed up. I think they have a couple of tours coming up in May, if I'm not mistaken. They may be sold out, but they may still have some, I'm not sure. Definitely learned a lot with the narration. Learned a lot in that engine shop tour, that's for sure. Two thousand seven Daytona five hundred victory chassis number eighty seven. Remember seeing a teenage Austin Dillon racing at the Concord Speedway here in North Carolina. He's come a long way. He had a pretty good shot there in Bristol this past week, I thought. One of the things we learned in the engine shops was, you know, the we got to see the Jimmy Johnson car that uh, engine that he raced at the Daytona 500 and they are recycling that engine as we speak it'll be run in Talladega and it'll probably be run as long as it doesn't get blown up it'll probably be run in Daytona for the summertime race but it was fun listening how they get in there, they recycle those engines when they can. And pray that they don't blow the engine because if they blow the engine, that's one engine less that they got to <laughs> survive the rest of the year with. So just as we have done time and time again here at RCR, this is where we're going to end this video. Thank you guys and girls again for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you have not already done so. Ring the bell for notification and leave awesome comments. Make sure you check out the other videos here at RCR and the Dale Earnhardt tribute video that we just did about two weeks ago. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in Martinsville.